next week, hopefully I'll have my vehicle back and then all my fire books. So we can do Boyle's Law. So uh, to, to do this lab, we need some type of contraption that will allow us to measure the volume as we change the pressure and measure the pressure uh, accurately while we measure the volume accurately. So, pressure gauge. Yes, we're going to use a tire gauge. Right? So, if you've looked at the report already, you'll see that I have a two liter bottle and a tire gauge built in. Right. Uh, so you can you can unscrew that cap, and you can drop a syringe in it. That's also capped off. Right. We're confining it. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh, it should be a two liter. That's an important distinction. Right. It should be a two liter bottle. Uh, so our syringe is in here. And it's got a plunger there, and then it's got a nipple down here, and we're going to set it at a, at a certain volume, I think 10 milliliters, and then plug that hole. Why do we plug that hole? Because if we don't, when we pressurize this environment, it's just going to push up inside here, and that syringe is not going to move. Right? We have not actually pressurized the gas in there in a way that we can read it. So we, we can find the gas, then we pressurize the vessel. And that pressure pushes down here on that syringe. And you'll see it drop. Okay, and you'll get down to between one and two milliliters probably by the time you get to 60 PSI. And I use fresh bottles every time. I, I used to reuse bottles, but one of them blew up. So we use fresh ones. They're supposed to be good to 100 PSI, easy. But if you pressurize and depressurize, pressurize and depressurize, you start developing little flaws in the bottle, and eventually it pops. It's kind of like airplanes. You know, when they go to altitude, they only pressurize at what? 5,000 feet, 10,000 feet, 8,000, something like that. That's why you go up in an airplane and say, if this thing is pressurized, why are my ears popping? Right? They don't pressurize it at atmospheric. They pressurize it at some altitude that's uh, breathable air. Anyway, as you go up and down, you pressurize and depressurize, and uh, the plane goes <laughs> over time. Right? So they have to go through periodic safety inspections to see if you're developing any flaws in the, in the plane so it won't come apart in the midair. But anyway, we're pressurizing this vessel, and the pressure inside here uh, is measured with your tire gauge. Right? right, so this thing's going to come out here and measure how much pressure is in there in PSI. All right, so you ask yourself how much pressure is actually on that cylinder? Well, it's the pressure that you measure in here plus. Atmospheric pressure. You got two pressures. You got the measured pressure plus atmospheric. Right. So we measure, we find atmospheric off the barometer that's in the lab. Right. So this measured pressure is going to be in psi. So convert that to atmospheres. Right. 14.7, 14.69, whatever. And the uh, I should say barometric. Because using ATM, you think it's units of measure. So this is barometric pressure, then would be whatever it happens to be at that time. And our barometer measures in inches of mercury. So you convert that to atmosphere. And we did that in one of our problems, didn't we? So just whatever converts 2992 inches of mercury is one atmosphere. So you use that. Then, once you get them in both the same units, then you can add them together. 
and that's the pressure that you record in your table. So you're going to have a table with pressure and volume. This will be in milliliters. That's fine. This will be in atmospheres. And you'll have uh, the best way to do it is to pressurize it first, then um, measure the pressure. And anybody who's done tires knows once you do that, it's going to go. You're going to lose a little bit, right? So measure the pressure first because you lose some in the process. Then look at the volume. Because right? if you look at the volume first, measure the pressure, the volume is going to change a little bit. So do the pressure first, then the volume. And you're going to fill in these values. But you're going to start from uh, high pressure to low pressure. So you, say you start at 60 PSI and you go down, I don't know, whatever the procedure calls for. I'm just making things up as I go along. And then you go down. And the last one you take, now these are, this is measured. So that's what you do in the lab. And then you'll have another column for the total. So that's where you add the barometric to it. Okay. So you're going to not atmospheric PSI. So what do you do for zero PSI? Measure the PSI. Take the cap off. Be sure that it's equalized. Right? And that's your zero PSI. Total then plus whatever atmospheric is, right? Okay. And for each one of those, you're going to get a volume in milliliters. Measure as close as you can get. Usually a tenth of a milliliter is doable. Down to, you can estimate that last one. One other trick, um, when, you, when you measure, uh, these syringes are the best I've found, but they're not perfect. Right? So uh, if you start at 10 mils here, when you get to zero, it's not going to be 10 mils. It's going to be like 9.7 or 9.8. So it, it tends to stick. And I know the procedure probably says lubricate it, which is okay. So we've got some lubricant you can put on it, some Vaseline or something. But even that isn't perfect. So uh, we measure from high pressure, low volume, up to zero pressure, and maximum volume. And each time you measure it, before you do, just take the bottle and go, just give it a whirl. And that'll, that'll help unstick it. Right. And then measure pressure and look at the volume that you take that. And that's all the data that you're going to get. But if we have time, you can do it a couple of times. You know, for, we call that replicate experiment. Replicate your experiment. It may not be exactly the same numbers the second time. Then, uh, how do you treat your data? So this is one where you're going to have a graph. So that's why at the very beginning we did that exercise in Excel. Because with Excel, you can graph your data. You can print it out, print out the graph, and cut it. And you know, actually, you put it in your notebook, cut it out, paste it in your notebook. And remember, whenever you do that, paste it in your notebook, sign it across that edge. Right? That's to ensure that if somebody, if something happens to it, you'll see part of your signature there and know, uh oh, something's missing. You may not be able to recover it, but at least you know something went wrong. Okay, back to the graphing your data. <clears throat> when you graph your data, <coughs> you're, you should get something like that a hyperbola, pressure against volume. So then you go and transform, transform your volume value to inverse volume. So the units here would be milliliters. Units here would be milliliters to the minus one. Right. 
because if milliliters here and you put them on the bottom, then overall, your units is milliliters to the minus one, right? And you, you'll have a uh, mega here, one over V, corresponding to each of your total pressures. You don't plot this one, you plot that one. Total pressure. So when you do that, should get a straight line. And you can do both of these in Excel. Now, uh, drawing a smooth curve may be difficult in Excel, but do the best you can. I know you can do a curve a lot, but you can like you draw a like just a straight point, uh -huh. and then you can grab it in the middle, like pull where it is. Okay. I know you can do that. I've done it long time. Uh, so when what do you do with that for your report? Well, if you highlight it and print it to a file, like uh, print it to an image file would be the best, like a JPEG or a, a GIF. Then you can take, when you do your Word document, you can insert uh, the uh, GIF file, the image file in there. And you can move it around, situate it, put a title under it if you want. In fact, that'd be advisable. The graph. The graph itself, uh-huh, yep. Um, okay, oh, any questions? You might think of some more when we get in there and start doing it next time. But that gives you something to think about, and hopefully preparedness is um, your best guarantor of safety. You know what you're doing when you go in, you're less likely to make mistakes. If you go in there with a, with a cold document and try to do the experiment, just reading instructions, then you're just asking for trouble. And some students get it just <laughs> wrong kind of trouble. Not just great trouble. It's like flying particles in your face, stuff like that. So know what you're doing before you go in. That's your safety guarantee. That plus wearing the right clothes. Cover up your toes, you know, cover up your legs, bring your lab coat. Okay. And like like I said before, we have you're gonna have to wear eye protection for this one. Especially since I know now that those bottles have a limited life. I mean, even new bottles could explode. So what you do is when you get your pump going, you got the, the tube over to your uh, attached to your vessel sitting over here and you're over here pumping it right so if it blows up at least you've got some distance between you. 